Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, so you can see what the talk is about and who I am. Um, first, uh, thank you to all of you from, uh, from this university uh, for organizing this conference and for giving all of us guests uh, a wonderful time. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, an unexpectedly uh, <coughs> kind and warm welcome and uh, to your wonderful island here. Uh, I'm regretting not having more time to, to be a part of it and, and to get to know you better. Um, and, and reading about the, the place and, and learning more about it, it's, it's interesting that we are here um, on Lesbos, in the Aegean, in part because, and, and I, have, I even have my, my paper copy of Thousand Plateaus here. Um, for those in Guattari, they, they do, for this question I'm raising, what kind of politics does an assemblage ontology become, or an act, or, or enable, perhaps, is a better uh, word to put there. Um, in the Aegean, they make a specific reference to the Aegean island societies relative to um, the ancient empires of, of Egypt and, and, and Syria and so forth, in that they say, in this place, in the ancient world, it was possible to appropriate, decode, and re-territorialize the esoteric knowledge of places like Egypt, and to appropriate the surplus, the stock of materials and food and goods and so forth, to build that kind of a sophisticated society without having the sort of despotic uh, regime or the large population. So it's, a, it's an interesting place in the world. Uh, and of course also the Aegean Islands and neighboring Ionia is, I think, where uh, for Deleuze and Guattari, their philosophical project, they would see the, the very early origins of it. And it's ironic that they are sort of this visceral, visceral hatred of Plato and Aristotle and so forth. I learned that uh, right here in the, the Calonis Bay of, of Lesbos is where Aristotle did his, his field work for his biology, uh, the first biological treatise in, in, in the West. And uh, it's of course also the home of Sappho. And it just got me thinking, I know they were separated by 200 years, but uh, it got me thinking as a line of flight, what would the history of the West have been like if Alexander the Great's tutor had been Sappho from here instead of Aristotle? And I think we'd be living in a much better world today. Um, so it's a very good place, I think, to be here to do this. And, uh, and it's been a personally very enriching thing, and, and I just wanted to say that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say some political things about all of this. I mostly come from the reading of A Thousand Plateaus. Uh, I've read some of the other work by Deleuze and Guattari. I am not an excruciatingly detailed reader of all of this literature as much. I try to work with it and use it, but I have some gaps certainly in the, the canon of all of this. But what I get from the work, particularly in the introduction, it's really explicitly said by them in the introduction, their project in this book, and I think more broadly, that we can call the, the beginnings of, of a certain sense of assemblage thinking, is to work against quote-unquote state philosophy or royal philosophy or philosophy based on interiority or identity. And they posit, I think, as a, as a normative, better way of thinking about the world, um, what they call minor philosophy, what I will call an assemblage ontology that raises the question of if state philosophy leads to presumably state practice and that is repressive, bad, does bad things, doesn't work in all sorts of ways, then what are the political implications for how does one behave politically on the basis of this different ontology? Is this in fact a more liberatory or whatever else you want to call it way of thinking and being? Um, another way of saying it, if the state has these bad consequences and they are asserting it's because of their underlying ontology, would having a different ontology get you to a different political place? And I think the answer was actually a little bit disconcerting to me. Uh, I'll give away the punchline. I think it's a lot more ambivalent than at first glance. And uh, if, if Dr. DeLando was here, he'd probably wince at this, because he can, 
he can explain each and every one of these and say, well, it's really not appropriate to put all of this on one side and everything else on the other. But, and I get that. But this is as a heuristic device to say that they have within that book, and I'm just re referencing Thousand Plateaus, there's other books and other authors you could draw from. They had this sort of binary split between what I would call the stuff they think is cool and they want to play with that they think is what they're contributing, not that it always does something they would call normatively positive, and all the stuff that they are, at the beginning, they're saying, we're tired of this stuff. We want to do something else. Let's, let's let our hair down and let's part it. Um, and it's a whole series of these binary oppositions. That's, that's my version of this. You could probably take some issue with it. Um, So, again, to sort of reiterate the point here, if that is a more, supposedly a more liberatory mode of thought of ontology that they think has some sort of political agency, um, well, does that, does that constitute a different form of political? What would that constitute? And one point, of course, is that I think actually we need to be really cautious about this. And I think some things that have been happening in the world in the past several years. I'm referring to the upsurge in the insurgent far right in Europe and North America. That's what really got me thinking about this. I got invited to this conference, and then Trump got elected, and I got to, re I got to think. <laughs> it, it came to me to, um, to actually recognize that this ontology, frankly, explains a good bit, I think, about more about that than about some sort of anarcho-libertarian sort of politics, which I think I ascribe intuitively to this kind of thought process. And I just want to make a, a basic assertion here that, you know, this is a very theoretical talk. I tend to try to do much more empirical stuff. But in any of this, it has to be applied through what they call uh, making a map through empirical testing of the world, as opposed to making a tracing and reproducing the, the, the kind of preordained categories of, of thought. And I'll, if I have enough time, to speak about their notions of a so-called itinerant or ambulant science as maybe the model for what people like us that are intellectuals are quote-unquote supposed to do, contra some sort of Leninist, self-appointed leader of the people to go on and do various things. That's certainly not their answer. But um, I think they have a certain notion of a role for certain types of specialized intellectual uh, people to do certain things. So, and we had a, a bit of a conversation about this this morning, uh, so I, I certainly recognize that these are polarities the molecular, the molar, the rhizome, the arborescent, so forth, and in the real world of assemblage, these things work out at some sort of intermediate point along the slider or control knob or whatever of ontology. Uh, so yeah, it's a continuous variable. I'm speaking about tendencies here. I'm not speaking about a binary between one or the other. Um, but this is particularly reading from the chapter uh, in uh, A Thousand Plateaus about um, segmentarity. And, uh, and that's, of course, the, the title that's dated 1933, which is a pretty relevant date to be thinking about 2017. I've been thinking a lot about 1933 this year for, for obviously ominous reasons. Uh, and it was ominous that they wrote that about 1933. So molecular forces are always part of all assemblages, but I am arguing that some assemblages in a, of a sort of a political, social nature, uh, they tend towards the molecular or towards the more molar in certain uh, instances. Um, it's true that these sort of molecular processes of deterritorialization and, and so forth, they often do thwart the state, the man, the system, by sort of leaking out the power that would allow it to function. Uh, and in a certain sense, in the so-called primitive societies, tribal societies, non-state societies, uh, the dominance of what, what, what Deleuze and Guadalupe call the supple uh, and cyclical kinds of segmentarity of not having permanent fixed government, destroying surpluses before they're allowed to 
be captured to constitute the state apparatus, having these kinds of social functions uh, thwarts or wards off the institution of the state. So, you know, molecular forces can do that. They can drain away the power uh, that the state possesses. Uh, they can do all sorts of interesting things. But there's a very important dark side, I would call, to thinking about this. Um, that's just what I already said there. Um, it may just be true, and of course it's a little bit dis un dissatisfying for me, that the, what I would call the anti-state role of the molecular is just to hold the state back. And of course I don't want to believe that there's some sort of way that um, anarchism or whatever can take over and we can sort of change the world and, and not just hold back something. But, um, and certainly in terms of the indigenous peoples who came out of this ontology, there's not very many of them left. The seven billion of whatever we are, type D civilizations, if we quote from uh, one of the earlier uh, talks in this. But, um, of course, one way also of thinking about this, and maybe this is more relevant to some of the talks that were given about environmental management, you know, the state, of course, can capture, can conjugate, to use their term, uh, and re-territorialize these molecular flows and in order to gain strength in a sort of Foucauldian sense of the little micro-capillary powers of everyday life. Um, and potentially, I mean, I work for a state university, I want to get grants, so do you. Um, that's often what we are, I think. We're, we're, we're trying to save the environment or bring about social justice or so forth. Um, if we can contribute something that makes the world better uh, by being sort of the, uh, I'm not that smart, but maybe some of you are the Leonardo da Vinci's of our contemporary Ludovico the Great um, in, in order to make the world a, a more beautiful place, that's potentially a role for us to play. Um, but to get to the sort of bad side of this, uh, the political agency of the micro-political um, has this really bad perspective. Um, when you read the part about May 68, that, that they mentioned very explicitly, May 68 was a molecular event. It was the breaking up, the slippage away of certain sectors of the French industrial working class, in particular the students, uh, in Strasbourg and in, in Paris, Nanterre and various other campuses, um, without any obvious declaration of such uh, from the state, from the party, the French Communist Party, from the official left, uh, in all sorts of ways that you didn't notice. And frankly, you know, Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI didn't really notice that these molecular forces were stripping away their legitimacy in the Ancien Regime until the mob came marching upon Versailles. So the, the micro-political can erupt suddenly into a thing like the French Revolution. Um, but then there's this part. <laughs> and I really didn't appreciate this part when I first read A Thousand Plateaus a long time ago. Um, they do not consider, quite the opposite, they do not consider fascism to be the opposite of this kind of ostensibly liberatory, anarchic kind of process. At first blush, fascism is the most molar, stratified, repressive, hard, linear thing in politics. They act like that. They talk like that. But within this ontology, as far as the DNG are concerned, fascism is not at all ontologically that. It is the dominance of the molecular constituting what they call a macro-fascism through a multitude of millions of little micro-fascisms instituted in everyday life that then can make a war machine, and they don't mean the military industrial complex here, they mean an apparatus outside of the state that in this case takes over the state and then becomes what, what Paul Virilio calls a, a suicidal state, uh, which sort of consumes itself and consumes the nation. But this is, fascism is a particular form of totalitarianism has a very different meaning for these guys than uh, the sort of typical, you know, this left authoritarianism, this right authoritarianism, whether it's Marshall Stalin or Adolf Hitler, six and one half a dozen of the other. It's not so with Deleuze and Guadalupe. They make a very important distinction. And um, you may be familiar with the work of Klaus Tevelite uh, about the, 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 um, the Freikorps, 
the proto-Nazi uh, groups uh, that were coming out of the First World War, veterans in Germany that were, I would say, highly rhizomatic and, and molecular uh, and um, were sort of the basis of this. And of course, that's the, the front book end of Nazism. At the back book end, this is Herr Dr. Goebbels uh, at, at the, the Sportspalast giving the total war speech and, and not calling upon sort of discipline uh, he, the end of his speak is Nun Volk uh, Steff Alp und Sturm uh, Break Los, which is uh, now people rise up and storm break loose. He's sort of hailing the German nation to become a kind of a Viking berserker, to become uh, a, a, a rhizome, to become uh, this crazy element, which certainly the last two years of the Third Reich has demonstrated. So, you know. With that being said, it really kind of took the wind out of my sails about the political potentiality of all these molecules getting free. I thought, oh yeah, we'll just get all the molecules free and we'll have, you know, anarchist utopia. No, you could get fascism. That's another potentiality. So, a little bit more about that before I finish, but uh, with the two minutes I have. But there is, of course, the possibility of the state being able to capture these flows. And that's the sort of nice, reformist, Angela Merkel, uh, let's all get along sort of version of this. And if I have to live in the world, I, I'm not sure that's the worst opportunity of the state being able to overcode and recapture these flows. And that's, I mean, that's kind of what the New Deal was in America, uh, capturing the flows that the Great Depression had sort of unleashed. Of course, in Germany, they did the sort of same thing and they got fascism. Um, in a very different political direction. There are several references to, to some of these elements uh, in Deleuze and Guattari, in the Thousand Plateaus, which are interesting historical cases of how certain states are able to either re-articulate or conjugate these molecularities or, or fail to do so. As mentioned, the Francois Fumier in France and how he sort of missed the boat of, he thought all these refugees coming from Germany were just more foot soldiers. And actually, uh, according to them, he missed the chance of sort of taking on the, Revo the, the Protestant Reformation and sort of putting France at the center of it. Um, in the case of Ming China, the way that they sort of overly sealed up the society, they made it too rigid. They kept all the molecules at home. They wouldn't let anybody trade or anything. And it led to an assemblage of piracy and commerce that eventually ruptured the state and, and, uh, and, and crippled it. So that's a, a kind of two negative versions of this. There's various positive ones that they mention, the people like uh, the great architect and military planner Vauban as a kind of itinerant genius uh, who alliance with Louis XIV is able to uh, enact state power and enact it in a, in, a, in a very powerful way. I'm not sure we want to be Vauban for, for Fortress Europe with Frontex, but, um, but that's... That's one of the things that they consider to be a positive. And, and to try to wrap up fairly quickly, um, this is what I'm really curious about where I think sort of my politics would lie. And I think from their perspective, they say, well, yeah, we can inhibit the state through these kind of supple, molecular segmentarity. Um, fascism is definitely not where I want to go, nor is a kind of authoritarian strength and rigidity, which, which will not, not work. And, yeah, I mean, this is the kind of uh, Ulrich Brecht, uh, uh, Ulrich Beck, rather, or uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Habermasian Europe, uh, where we can have a nice, friendly, social democratic world. Um, but to get a little bit to the end of this here, you'll probably have some issues with this argument, but I think in the past decade, what has happened which is very confusing politically. It is a very confusing political time. Someone mentioned that this morning. Um, I think rightist politics has sort of taken the initiative as being this molecular tendency. And, uh, and it, as a result, I think in reaction, leftist politics have taken on this defensive, molar, hold the line kind of politics. And we get very confused when people like Trump say, build a wall. Because it sounds like he's, he is the voice of the Roman Empire. But no, he's a fascist. And, uh, and as a result, I think we need to 
really rethink some of these things. And just for a few very brief examples, because I know I'm over time, you may know this meme. This is Pepe the Frog, uh, who is the, the darling of the alt-right, been turned into a fascist online meme. I can't think of anything more appropriate to talk about the molecularity of the contemporary alt-right than these memes, these little tiny quanta of cognition that they fire off all over social media and, and online gaming and all sor sorts of things. And they're actually starting to sort of create these knots of arborescence. They're popping up in, in for example, Steve Bannon and Breitbart. They're in the goddamn White House, um, which have sort of burst through. It was a long, tedious, drip, drip, drip process over the past few years. Everybody thought they were silly. In France, of course, you have Marine and Jean d'Arc, which is a very strange image for them to actually hold up to, because Jean d'Arc is a very, to use Max Weber's term, is a very charismatic, non-bureaucratic kind of leader. Of course, Jean d'Arc is affiliated with the Vichy regime. They held her up. That's an obvious reason that they, they, they draw upon her. But um, I think they're also drawing upon this sort of molecular, anti-state kind of thing. And, of course, in America, we think we're good little liberals like me. We think we're very smart, and we think we're we think we're the rebel alliance, and the enemy is, of course, Darth Vader. But they've they've done this too, right? So this is real. This is not a spoof. They like this. They think they're the rebel alliance. They think, and I, actually, I think ontologically, they may have the point because right now in America, I'll skip ahead because I'm over time. Right now in America, if you're a good Democrat, meaning Democratic Party and you're in the quote-unquote resistance, you say things right now like, well, we need to protect the FBI and the CIA and their autonomy from this bad government. <laughs> but this is the CIA that put the colonels in power here in Greece. These are bad people. We have to protect NATO and NAFTA because those are like our values. We have to replay the Cold War and we have to protect uh, Merkel in Germany, which is impoverished in destroyed Greece as the defender of Western values. So we're all screwed up in this sense. Um, that's from America, and that's a different perspective. I'm sure you can say things about how that works here in Europe. Um, but you know, at certain times, like World War II, the left presented itself as a kind of molarity. We have not always been the molecular 1968 kind of thing. I'm not sure that that's going to work out in 2017. Uh, I'm not sure we have to be condemned to that, um, but that is, I think, some of the, the way that this is being presented. Frankly, that's the way some of the argumentation is being presented. So that's a rather depressing story, I think, but I am out of time. I'm already four minutes over, so I will stop in the interest of um, us eating before midnight, and, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm all for, for, for discussion, and so I don't want to take more of your time than I have. So thanks.